This has led to a really strange place. I'm sorry. This is what happens when you put two interested people together. Alan Alda is an award-winning actor, writer, director, and podcast host. You probably know and love him as Hawkeye on MASH and Senator Arnie Vinnick on The West Wing, or his incredible films like The Aviator or Crimes and Misdemeanors. He has been nominated for everything, just everything. Tonys, Oscars, Emmys, Golden Globes, People's Choice Awards, just no big deal. He was also inducted into the Television Hall of Fame. And now he hosts his popular podcast, Clear and Vivid, where he continues to broaden the public's understanding of science and empathy, and really just being the most compassionate man in town. Alan, my lovely friend, I am just over the moon to see your face. You, you praise me too much with the most compassionate <laughs> man. Please. I think like most people who talk about something incessantly, it's because they need more of it. <laughs> You have been, you have been a source of endless empathy to me. So, Alan, I've never had a repeat guest before, but, but, but it's you, and I just felt like, well, first of all, I have so much more to learn from you. But second, I met you at the very beginning of both of our podcast journeys. We were, yeah. we were baby podcasters, and we had each other on to. To boost each other's listenership. <laughs> well, I, the, the, now let's be, now let's be clear about who was boosting who. When I started my podcast, it was still like family and friends who were <laughs> agreeing to be on it. So you were my very like when you said yes, I became a fancy lady. I I, I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, but you must have done better than me. You have a fancy neon sign behind you. <laughs> well, I have a great insistence that everything be made into a sign. So I'll, I'll get you one that says most compassionate man in town. <laughs> great. <laughs> It'll be official. I wondered, since we both started a new industry, new medium, new, like get, starting a podcast is giving yourself a weird new job. And I wondered... Wait, how old were you? Eighty-two when you started your podcast? I don't, well, let's see, maybe eighty-three. I don't. I can't remember. <laughs> what motivated you to start a big fat new project? Oh, you know, I I I didn't think of it until somebody said to me, well, "If you want to raise money for the all the Center for Communicating Science, yeah. why don't you do a podcast?" Yeah. So we have sponsors and, uh, you know, foundations that support the show. Yeah. And all the money after expenses goes to support the Center for Communicating Science, which has trained over 20,000 scientists and medical professionals to communicate better. Mm. So when people listen to the show, even if they don't like it, they're doing good. <laughs> so it's a little like eating your broccoli, you know? <laughs> If you don't find it entertaining. <laughs> what a, when you think about legacy, do you think about that center? And I mean, it's been an incredible force for good. Tell me a little bit about what you love most about what it's done. Well, I didn't know how, how really useful it was going to be. I thought it would help scientists explain their work to the rest of us yeah. in the public who haven't spent our lives learning physics and medicine and biology the way they have. Yeah. And they, they're siloized in addition to being scientists or, or doctors. Yeah. They have such specific fields they study yeah. that they sometimes can't talk to one another any better than they can talk to us. And that was one of the first things I found out that it was going to be useful for was scientists talking to one another or talking better, having better communication on a team. Mm. Yes, that space between us and how we can bridge it and how difficult it is to get there. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. There's no communication if you don't acknowledge that this other person may be thinking and feeling things that are not so evident, and you got to figure out what they are. Yes. 
Yes, and the price of not figuring that out, I mean, for our culture, for our own lives, is just is too high. Yeah, well, we just went through the pandemic, which we're still going through, and a lot of people don't even realize it. Yeah. That was a case of trying to figure out what tens of millions of people were thinking or feeling Hmm. when you told them they had to lock themselves up. Yeah. And some people threw out the baby with the bathwater and said, this whole thing is no is, is phony. It's, the vaccines are phony. You'll you'll get sick from what from the medicine. Mm-hmm. I think communication could have been a little better. Yes, yes. You um, when we talk about communication, <laughs> I mean, because one of my favorite things about you is summarized in your lovely book title. If I understood you, would I have this look on my face? And which always makes me laugh because I think of the Alan Alda-ness of you as this very deliberate, lovely way that you like to approach people. And I don't want to embarrass you, except I will, because the other day I was talking to the wonderful Ann Patchett about how we get to know people, especially strangers or especially interviewing, like being curious about someone we don't Mm. already know, and then kind of getting in the mix with them. And she said, you know, I have a person in mind who really, really changed my perspective. And I said, oh, I have a person in mind, too. (laughs) And then we both said, Alan Alda changed me. (laughs) That's great. That's great. That's great, Evan, to say that. (laughs) It's true, because you have a certain magic with connecting with others And I wondered if I could just get very nosy about some of them because you do it now every week on your podcast. And I always want to just ask you, like, for instance, curiosity. I think curiosity is core to who you are. What fuels your curiosity? Boy, I wish I knew because every once in a while, a teacher or somebody will say to me, my students aren't curious. How do I get them to be curious? It's hard for me to answer that because I'm, I think by nature I'm curious. I remember in my 20s standing in elevators going up to a high floor and I'd be looking at the panel of buttons and I'd think, I wonder how somebody put this in. Somebody, somebody stood here with a screwdriver and connected all those wires to those buttons. I wonder how they did that. Yeah. And there was no purpose in wondering that. I just yes. wonder about things like that. I went when and when I was in my twenties and I was still struggling to get work as an actor. I had a manager, and I'd visit him in his office, and I felt comfortable in his office. So when I found, when I read someplace that your temperature changes by a couple of degrees all during the day, it goes up, it goes down, hmm. your body temperature. I thought it would be interesting to check that out and and see if it really does change. You did not. And how much it does. So every hour I take a thermometer out of my pocket. (laughs) And about the third time I did this in my manager's office, he said, how am I going to get you work if every time you go in to get a job, who's going to give you a job with that thing in your mouth? (laughs) You know, I think that is, I think One of the things that I believe in most is that virtues can't always be instrumentalized. Like they are good because they are good in and of itself. So I think that's such a a wonderful foundation to think about curiosity. It is, it is good for its own sake. I think you're right. And, and you're right. You don't have to monetize it. Yes. Or or be interested in anything except interest, like the fact that your temperature was going to go up and down a few yeah, degrees. I wasn't going to really get anything out of that. <laughs> I'm just thinking of times in which I've tried to improve my own curiosity. What did think, you do? Well, I think I did it because I felt personally disconnected from somebody, and I didn't know how to get that goodwill back. Mm. And so I thought... Well, if I could just find something that they're very interested in, which, I mean, it's, so, it's always wonderful hearing somebody describe something that they're... It is, but you've got you to gotta instantaneously, as you said, you have to instantaneously come up with 
real curiosity. Yeah. And my problem is when I ask somebody about what they're interested in or passionate about, my first reaction instantaneously is, really? <laughs> is it really? I was... What a, I was... What is, what a, what a strange thing to be interested in. <laughs> and then I got to like force myself to say, no, no, be curious about this. I was stuck next to a potato manufacturer the other day on a flight. <laughs> and that was honestly the best two hours I've spent in a really long time. What happens when they're purple potatoes? Does it dye all the instruments? <laughs> you know, and it does. They've got to have a special dye remover just for all the purple They have potatoes. a dye remover? They do. And we're eating that? <laughs> but that's, that's actually not something I followed up on. I got really confused about what happens to all the peels. <laughs> so. What do they do? Do they feed them to the animals or what? They give them to a group of, um, like a local religious group I knew a lot about. And then, it, and then the conversation devolved into me being very interested in that religious group. Well, what does the religious group do with potato peels? The Hutterites, well, they take it to their farm and then they feed it to their animals, I believe. But the uh -huh. problem is their um, – this was being explained to me very carefully and I was very interested – is that they always do it in a giant uh, wooden flatbed that has a hole in it and it leaves purple potato peels for miles to their farm and it drives, <laughs> it drives the potato farmers crazy. So, well, they don't mean to have the hole. No, but it's it's easy to it's easy to track them down if you want to find out. <laughs> this, is, this, is, this has led to a really strange place. <laughs> I'm sorry. This is what happens when you put two interested people together. <laughs> but it's fascinating. Tell me more. <laughs> you have this lovely phrase too about ignorance as an ally. Like it's okay if you don't know what to say next, as long as it's backed up by genuine interest. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. It's true. It, it's it's okay not only not to know what to say next, but I believe I've found that it's okay to be ignorant about something. Yes. As long as you're curious to know more. Yes. How are you so good at making people feel like you're interested? I mean, how how if someone felt like they weren't very good at responsive listening, what suggestions do you have for how people could better express their you can curiosity. Practice. It really is relating to the other person. Yeah. It's letting them in. Mm -hmm. It's not it's not being so concerned with what you have to tell them yeah. as you are with what they have to tell you. And and what about them? I really before I talk to them on a podcast, yeah. I watch them on YouTube videos as much as that's possible. Not where they're giving a lecture or a talk but where they have to relate to somebody else. Hmm. And the way, the way in which they relate best is something that I find I can make use of. Huh. I, I study them. I, some, and I only talk to people on the podcast who I think I'll have a good conversation with. <laughs> I don't talk to people in order to catch them at something or disagree with them. Yes, Disagreeing is fine, but it, as long as I can learn from it, yeah. Or one of us can learn from it, or one of us can come to a new mutual understanding. Yes. I mean, early on, I talked to a philosopher who thought that empathy was overrated. Oh, boy. <laughs> and I really looked forward to talking with him because the basis of pretty much everything I do lately has to do with empathy. Yeah. So I said, let's have a let's have an experiment. Let's see how much we can agree on the on the whole issue. And it turned out we agreed a lot about almost everything. What a wonderful way to start a conversation. I can just think of, you know, ten different political issues that if someone wanted to talk to someone else about, they could start with saying, Let's figure out how much we can agree on. Yeah, you know, I I've talked to a lot of people. Without talking politics, I've talked with a lot of people on the podcast about how they talk to people who don't agree with them. Yeah. And it seems that the most common practical approach is to first establish what you agree on, hmm. truly agree on, what uh, you live your life that way, not just a principle or an idea, yeah. but something that you, you give your heart to. We give our heart to our children, yeah. to 
to the truth, to people who help other people. Mm. And we all have examples of that. And we, we get together on that basis. There's more trust. There's more yeah. willing willingness to say, I don't have to best this person. I don't have to hate this person. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And that goes for both sides. I mean, both we're in a, a, an unfortunate divide in the country now. But both sides are willing to hate the other side. Yes. Most yeah. of the time. So it sounds like you almost need to start with a desire, the desire to want to see somebody's goodness. Yeah, I think that's true. To believe you can. Yeah. To be- now there, you know, there are people who, for the most part, you don't want to be near because they're dangerous. They're serial. I, I, if I'm next to a serial killer, I don't want to know how he feels. I don't want to. I want to. I want to know where the door is. <laughs> but then I'm pretty sure you'd be very interested in how he feels. You'd read it, and <laughs> well, then you'd read a few books about yeah, it. Right, right. But it's it's confusing to be human because it's not easy to some say to think somebody is all good or all bad. Yeah. 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 I don't know. Maybe not. You said yeah twice. That sounds like maybe you think. No, it's I'm not just true. No, I'm just uh it's kicking into my thinking place <laughs> where I'm trying to come up with examples. But I um I think that's certainly one of the most like fruitful theological debates like we have in Christian circles is how do we accurately describe that mix of good and bad in a way that propels us toward greater love. Hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting. So what's the solution? How do you how do you bridge that? I know, because there's hundreds of different denominations that will parse that. They'll sort of meet out the percentages uh, differently of how bad, how bad when, when, you know, when is the, when precisely is the fall? When is our fall? When is, hmm. but I, I think the, I think the place where I kind of drop the anchor theologically is in some mix some mix of good and bad, which creates some mix of possibility for change. And that so much of just like, you know, prudential wisdom is in trying to figure out how much choice does any one person have in the situation they're in and then to meet them with a a lot of grace for that, (laughs) that particular context. Choice about what? Choice about... How much they can change, you know, like whether... Like, for instance, if if I really, really, really disagree with somebody about almost everything and I'm trying to develop compassion for them, then I'm trying to understand, like, what what part of their world can they not change? <laughs> and then what small part of their world I'm thinking can they change? And trying to – I guess that to me is, like, how I define grace is, like, <laughs> seeing – seeing from their perspective how much they're able to change or not. So that's interesting. That's How does that match up with what people say sometimes that sounds kind of believable to me, that you can't expect anybody to change? Oh, I... <laughs> you, can't, you, can't actually, yeah. you certainly can't change them yourself. They have to change on their own. You know, it's one of the, I think one of the things we end up talking about a lot on the podcast every time I hear a life story is trying to figure out like the right way to describe what I think of as limited agency, like the not everything is possible and the Mm -hmm. not nothing is possible, but that small bit of traction that we all have in our life to get, you know, to make any kind of progress. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, and if I don't understand that about somebody's life, I find it very difficult to understand them. Because you, you do, you meet some incredibly lucky people who just had a thousand choices and an endless possibility. And then you meet some people who had almost no choices but did what they could with what they had. And I, I, that's always been kind of an intellectual topic that I've always, I, I, could, I could see that story played out a thousand times and I would never be bored. I knew somebody once who seem to have to be right all the time. Yes. And if you said something and it, that it happened on a Tuesday, he'd say, stop you and say Wednesday. Yes. Which was not an important part of the story. 
I hate that. And then I, j- I kept watching him and listening to him. Yeah. And I realized that that probably was never going to change. Uh-huh. But that there were things he did that were so generous and sweet. Yeah. That I could just looked past what I found an annoying habit. Yeah. 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 <laughs> right. <laughs> Everyone is such a grab bag in that, aren't they? And I, I when I think about your work in in responsive listening, in that kind of critical empathy that you have, how do you how do you teach responsiveness to the person that's in front of you, knowing that most of probably who they are won't really change. Yeah, I'm, I'm, ha- I'm happy to answer that. But before I do, I have to not, I have to deflect, parry your compliment about how empathetic I am. <laughs> because I struggle like everybody else did. Well, not everybody struggles to be empathic, but mm-hmm. I do. Mm. And I'm, I've always been capable of making a joke at someone's expense that wasn't warranted. <laughs> Me too. So it's not, not so easy to do. No. But one way to improve it is to practice. Mm. Especially while I was writing the book you mentioned. Yeah. I would, almost all the time when I was out of my house, I'd be in the street I'd be looking at people and trying to figure out what they were going through. Yeah. The cashier in a diner. The way the way she says have a good day. Is she connected to anything? Is she is she having a divorce at home? What what's mm. what's going on? Mm. And you you don't get the answers, but the effort to look into this other person, to hear the tone of voice to hear the choice of words. Mm. I think I think you can practice it. Yeah. And before you speak, you can think of there's a better thing to say than but. Yes. Somebody says, it's a beautiful day today. I, I look forward to it. Yeah, but you know, it's supposed to rain. <laughs> In the afternoon. Yeah. It's better to find something you can agree with in what they said. Mm. It doesn't always happen easily, you know, because you, often our first inclination is to yes. deflect the other person. There's a version of that, too, for people who are in pain where... I think it comes out of a desire to be understood, but it does always try to f- to fit in the the difficult or negative in order to just get back to yes, but you don't understand that my life is really hard uh, right now. Yeah, 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 and yeah. I, have, I have so much compassion for that, but it is very difficult when you when like a desire to be understood has a way of like spiking every volleyball. I know what you mean, and when you talk about compassion, you bring up a, a thought. I wonder if you make this distinction that that I do, that empathy is not the same as compassion. Yeah, tell me more. Yeah. Because empathy can open the door to compassion, but not necessarily, and and it's not necessarily what you need in a given moment. If you're talking to someone you, you care about and you get a glimpse into what they're feeling, you can use your decision to be compassionate to help them help them be better off. Mm-hmm. If you're talking to a used car salesman and you empathically determine that this person is talking a line of crap, <laughs> compassion is not the way to go. Yeah. Yeah. Confronting him with the facts or just leaving yeah. is the way to go, it seems to me. Yeah. But it, so therefore I think of empathy as a tool and people can use it to your disadvantage. The used car salesman is sizing me up trying to figure out what makes me excited. 
what makes me buy. Yes. Not what's good for me, but what makes me buy. Yes. That's so helpful, Alan. I'm, I hadn't thought... I hadn't thought enough about that because, I mean, I've I've seen all kinds of different forms of that emotional intuition, that that ability to read other people's emotions that really cuts both ways. Yeah. yeah. Like uh, like there's a particular word for people who can really carefully read other people's emotions and then they manipulate it and feed off of it, and that is the word ghouls. <laughs> <laughs> and, you, and you meet them every now and then, but you're like, yeah. oh, but I keep thinking, oh, my gosh, you're really empathy. You're deeply empathetic. And it scares the crap out of me. <laughs> yeah. An emotional abuser. Yes. Is pretty good at knowing where your weak spots are, where you're yeah. what will really hurt. Yeah. And a backhanded compliment that they don't have to take credit for being cruel about. Is a great way to to get you right where you you don't want to be got. Yes, yeah. I'm just thinking about what you said about practicing, and I wondered: Are there gifts in aging when it comes to communication? Yeah, you can't hear all the bad things people say. <laughs> You can pretend you didn't hear it. Too. I did used to play in my cello quartet a lot for in retirement. <laughs> retirement homes and i can always tell when my like stravinsky was going badly because i could just see one hand go up to it to a, to an uh to a hearing aid and just like boop me out and I, was like, <laughs> and I was like i can see you i know what you're doing <laughs> that's funny I, I think it helps it can help in a lot of ways about empathy i don't know yeah depends if you've been worried it gives you more time to work on it Yes. You're there longer. But I don't know if there's anything about it. Things, one good thing about aging seems to be that more insignificant things drop away. Yeah. It doesn't bother me as much if I'm really badly in need of a haircut. <laughs> I, mean, I, I literally have the thought, hey, I'm old. That's nice. What, what are they going to say? They're going I to say like, he's old. I like that. <laughs> I read a poem the other day where someone was described as having a raw old age, or like a wild old age, and I loved oh. it. It described to me, it was like described growing into a kind of permission to say and do. <laughs> that, that I thought what was What do lovely. they do? Eat, eat ice cream for breakfast? How, much, <laughs> I think how wild are they? <laughs> I think they were describing some ferocious truth-telling. Oh, I, oh like I see. One of the things that seems very core to you is you have a very – I'm thinking about what you said about perspective and what things – how to make a big deal perhaps of some things of not and not others, which I find so refreshing – um, but you've been through a lot in the last few years, which you've also, I mean, been very, I don't want to say nonchalant, but really like, hey, this is, this is, I remember the last time we talked and you'd had this like life or death situation and you're like, yeah, and that's what that was. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> so when I heard about your diagnosis, I thought this is a man who's going to be a combination of, he's going to have some deep acceptance about this. Well, I really do believe reality is our friend. Yeah. To ignore reality can be really life-threatening. Yeah. And so when I got the diagnosis of Parkinson's, I only got the diagnosis because I insisted on more tests. Mm. I, the only clue I had in Parkinson's was that I saw an article in a newspaper, a column on health yeah. that described a couple of doctors who were rare in finding that people who acted out their dreams who had what's called REM sleep disorder huh. often were diagnosed later with uh, Parkinson's. I see. And I, I, I had several of these strange experiences while dreaming where one huh. was Somebody was attacking me, and I picked up a sack of potatoes and threw it at them. Oh. And in reality, I was throwing a pillow at my wife. 
<laughs> so then there was two things to worry about. One, what, what else would I throw at her <laughs> if this went on? Yeah. And do, did it mean that I had Parkinson's? So <clears throat> <clears throat> I went to a, a doctor who gave me a physical test for Parkinson's and said he didn't see I, any sign that I had it. Hmm. And I insisted on a scan, which I'm not sure now is definitive. But after the scan, he said, no, I see deposits of plaque, Ah. and you got it. Well, knowing that gave me the chance to start an exercise program quickly. I see. And and people, I know um, now that a lot of people know I have Parkinson's, Friends and people I don't even know are asking me for advice. And there's a surprising number of people who don't want to believe mm. that a, an exercise program structured especially for Parkinson's can hold off the progression of the disease for quite a while. Wow. And it still is going to progress no matter what you do. At mm. the moment, there's no accepted uh, cure for it. There's certainly no cure for it and even the alleviation of the symptoms so is, 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 okay, is good for some people with certain mm-hmm. regimens, but not everybody. Yeah. It reminds me of a, a prayer that I started praying right when I got sick was, God, let me see things as they really are. Mm. That's good. I just, I couldn't figure out a way around. I wanted to avoid the worst of everything. And I, I knew that I couldn't quite, because I was so scared. I, I knew I couldn't quite even let my thoughts settle on what was really happening. But I knew that I should probably try to get there. <laughs> so that was, I thought, always felt like that was my sanest prayer. Like, <laughs> okay, God. <laughs> what was your most insane prayer? Oh, just fix everything, also cure mortality. <laughs> <It's> just, <laughs> why can't you make an exception for me? <laughs> I know. Yeah. You know, I, I don't know where it comes from. I wish I could figure out how to help people achieve something that I had automatically. I mean, it sounds like I'm bragging, but I'm not because it was automatic. I didn't, mm. I didn't work on this. But there was a moment when I needed emergency surgery 20 years ago, almost exactly 20 years ago. Yeah. I was in Chile on top of a mountain, and I had an obstruction in my gut that meant if if it exploded, I'd, I'd be dead within a couple of hours. Wow. They got me down the mountain, an hour bumpy ride down a dirt road to a hospital in the middle of the night and the doctor quickly diagnosed it as um, as what it was and told me that I needed surgery. And within a few minutes, they were putting this thing over my face t- to put me out. <laughs> and in that moment, I thought, well, I might not wake up from this. So I want to get word to my wife and children and grandchildren. Hmm. So I, I dictated a note, which was kind of prosaic. and Not much you can say that's meaningful. And anyway, the person I dictated it to lost a note. Stop! Which is, which is perfect. I mean, it's exactly, it matches the, uh, the utility of what I said. But the moment when I thought, well, I might not wake up from this. Yeah. I was, I felt so lucky to have that act, that reaction. Mm-hmm. But I wonder if it's not more common. I wonder if you're really, really faced with this side of the revolving door or the other side of the revolving door. Mm-hmm. What's, what's your feeling? Is it like, mm-hmm. oh, well, well, this was inevitable. Wasn't it? <laughs> I don't think... I don't think so. I am. It's like a joke. You don't know what the punchline is going to be. Yes. It, when it comes up, it makes you laugh. Yes. It does feel like that bubbly feeling, doesn't it? I, I mean, it, it is, 
there are some thoughts that feel almost impossible to land. But, and then in the middle of it, I'm always just so grateful though, that there is moments of like crystalline clarity in it. And then you can, when you get one, you just, you, you have to, you have to keep it as long as possible. Like mm. these are my loves. These are all the things I, I will, could never live without. These are the, the things that people might have to live with without me. You know, there's a, there's a, a wonderful, brutal stripping away that can happen. I think when we see reality or we try to make reality into our friend for a second, I'm sure we all do it in bits and pieces, but it sounds like you're good at reality. <laughs> well, it may just be denial because I think denial has been good for me. <laughs> Tell me how. Tell me how. <laughs> well, you just don't suffer as much. <laughs> you remind me. I mean, again, I don't take credit for it. I don't, I don't promote denial. I don't. I don't. Make, I don't practice it. I don't see if I can get better at it. <laughs> or if you did, you would deny it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Maybe that's what it is. I am curious about because last time we talked, when you described not being afraid of death, I wonder if that's related to the feeling, which is I don't know, a determination to only suffer as much as you need to. Like you'll, you will manage things as. I mean, I, I think this is how I felt about incurable cancer, which was incurable at the time <laughs> and then has subsequently been more curable <laughs> than I realized, mm -hmm. was taking things bit by bit saved me from trying to suffer all at once. And it sounds like that's been part of how you've managed Parkinson's. That may be, but it also sounds like something unconscious, an unconscious mechanism. Hmm. I mean, can you decide? Maybe you can. Can you decide? to not suffer more than you have to because if, sometimes you can't help it. It reminds me of someone I know who teaches empathy to doctors. But she also teaches them when to pull back on the empathy so they don't burn themselves out. Yeah. Enough empathy to know what the patient is going through, what is the best way to, de to help them understand what's happening to them, mm -hmm. but not so much that they suffer what every patient suffers, because they're getting hit with a lot of stuff to be empathic about. Mm -hmm. So she helps them get in and get out. Mm -hmm. And that's a little like what you're talking about, about not suffering more than you have to. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's exactly right. Yeah. I wonder if that's part of um, retirement, honestly. I've been thinking a lot about retirement because I have all kinds of friends who are retiring, and they they try to explain transitions that they make, uh, one in which they just sort of stop the job that they were doing, and that's that's always, I think, really not at all what re retirement is, which is a kind of long existential process <laughs> about which that it seems to have phases, like phases of deciding what feeds you, what excites you, and then maybe what exhausts you. How have you been making those decisions? I'm saying that because you are like 277 episodes into your podcast, sir. <laughs> well, and I had no idea that I was going to be so interested in it that I'd I devote so much time to it. Yeah. But it grew out of an interest that I had, which was exercising my curiosity, I guess, about pretty much everything. Yeah. And communication and that kind of thing. And I don't know how anybody retires from a job or a line of work without having already established interests in other things that they can now be obsessive about. Hmm. What kind of other stuff uh, gets your obsessive interest? Are you into birding? I mean, because I've really, I've always struggled with finding other things to be obsessive about. I'm obsessive about people and, you know, whatever I'm researching. Yeah. But I, I've just never been a hobby person. And so I do imagine that retirement would be a horrible existential tar pit. Well, I, 
I, I can't. I'm, I'm interested in so many things. If I had the time, I'd be obsessed with writing code for the computer. Would you? Wow. Yeah, but I don't. I'm obsessed about writing. Yeah. And even when I don't have the time, I find myself writing something, which, because I'm not obsessed, isn't as good as it should be. <laughs> but I, the, the things I've done that were not my regular professional pursuits have been things that I was just always into, always curious about, always muddling around in. Hmm. And and many of those things come together on the podcast, so I'm very happy. And I still once in a while get an offer to act, and I love acting. Yes. So, so far... Because of the Parkinson's, I can, I can play either. Either I can play anybody with Parkinson's, or I can do a really good milkshake. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Wait, you were in Marriage Story, right? Yeah. Oh my gosh, you were so good. Yeah, the he, he the director let the the, the tremors yeah. show. I thought I was hiding. My my hand was under the desk <laughs> in one shot. And and I and I and I got my hands still. My whole, then my rest, my whole body is oh, It's got to come out somewhere. Yeah. 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 The last three or four things I've done, it's been a kind of a subtext, but I think that's fine because one of the ways people suffer with that disease, and I'm sure many other diseases, is that there's a stigma associated with it. Yeah. The public isn't aware because people hide it, the early, hide the early stages. I see. It's a, it's a vicious circle. Yeah. It's considered, I'll start on one, one part of the circle. Because yeah. people hide the early parts of the symptoms, the public generally only sees Parkinson's mm-hmm. patients at their worst near I the see. end. Yeah. Either they're in a wheelchair or they're stumbling around as if they're drunk. Yeah. Part of that stigma would go away if people saw that the only symptom was a little twitch in the thumb. Yeah. Or something even lighter than that. Yeah. And you could, and there, are, there are thousands and thousands of people now who have normal lives and have Parkinson's. Mm-hmm. It would be a little better for everybody, I think, if they could be open about it. But they're they're blocked from that because yeah. there's a genuine fear. If they know I have Parkinson's, will they keep me on? Oh. Will somebody make a long-term uh, arrangement with me if I'm going to be stricken mm. before too long? So th- the ignorance about it, mm-hmm. unfamiliarity with it, not being able to take it in stride mm. is not good for the patients, not good for the public, it's not good for employers. Mm. It's not good for mates, spouses, members of the family. Yeah. They hear a diagnosis of Parkinson's, they go, oh my God, that's the worst thing that can happen. Mm. It's not the worst thing that can happen because, as they say, you don't die from Parkinson's, you die with it. I see. So to remove the stigma as much as possible, I mean, your openness about your cancer treatments, very helpful. Thanks. Thanks. It was, I, I, got, I got good advice early on about, um, I remember one of my first guests when she was asked, uh, what can we do for people with cancer or and she's like, oh, give them jobs. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Cause, That's you know, good. Because, like, casseroles are great. And also... Casseroles are great. <laughs> but most of us are living, you know, with things that we will, that will become part of life as a chronic condition. So let us have life as a chronic condition. And you gave yourself a job with the podcast. <laughs> I did. I did. I did. I needed something to take up... Um, I needed something to take up more space 
because I thought I kind of pictured it like it would squeeze cancer down to a more manageable size. And I think that is actually exactly what happened. Not obsessing about the cancer. Yeah. Yeah. And then I could, you know, you get you get something to do and then all of a sudden you have people to meet and then you all of a sudden you have things to learn about. And then all of a mm -hmm. sudden you're thinking about something that's not you and your dumb, horrible problems. And I, I have found that to be, I think that's part of, for me also, the cure for self-pity is the more interested I am in other people, the, the less I. Oh, good. That's uh, that sounds very reasonable. <laughs> well, it comes and goes. I have my moments. <laughs> well, that's the trouble with all the rules to live by. Yes. Is if you can achieve one once or twice a year. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. I guess that kind of humility, I mean, brings us always back then to the feeling of wanting to know what we don't know. Hmm. Which I hope will just make us curious Hungry, hungry hippos <laughs> forever. Alan, I really love that about you. And it means I love your podcast, but I just, I love your, I love your genuine desire to be changed by what you learn from other people. And I hope, I hope I'll become more like that. I really do. Well, that's you too. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. It's been fun talking with you. Alan, you really are my uh, favorite, and I'm sorry for all these compliments, but they are uh, they are genuine. Well, you have no right to speak to me that way. <laughs>